All right, so while everybody's sitting down getting coffee, water, donuts, I'm going to go ahead and start. So welcome to Grand Rounds. It's a beautiful October morning, and so I'm very thankful that all of you are here, and we have an excellent Grand Rounds today. So Dr. Shivani Garg is going to be presenting Grand Rounds, and she is one of our newer faculty in the Division of Rheumatology who joined us last year in 2017. Dr. Garg went to medical school at the Government Medical College and Hospital in Chandigarh, India. She did her residency at Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, followed by her rheumatology fellowship at Amory. And if that was not enough, she is currently in her first year and a half of faculty doing her master's in clinical investigation and research here uh, at the School of Medicine and Public Health, and she's graduating in December. She's been incredibly productive uh, in her first year here. She has eight uh, refereed articles and four abstracts. She's done an invited national workshop. And I think really most notably, uh, she's developed two uh, new clinics here at UW Health. And for any of you who've done any new innovative work in the clinical realm, you know the kind of energy and time it takes to create a vision for a new clinical enterprise, to get the business plan together for that, and then really move forward. And so she has started this year our state's only lupus clinic and the nation's fifth lupus nephritis clinic, which I think is amazing. So I guess it's no surprise she's going to talk to us today about lupus. So. Dr. Garg, could you please come on stage? And she's going to... Her grand rounds is lupus, past, present, and future. And at the end of her grand rounds, we will have some questions. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Tobridge, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Several months back, I saw a patient in my clinic. She comes from uh, for a follow-up, patient Z. So she does not look good that morning. She has rashes, ulcers in her mouth, looks very tired. We start talking about how are things going, how is she feeling, and how are medications doing for her. Uh, she gives vague answers, makes me ask her, Z, how many medications, how many doses of hydroxychloroquine have you missed in the past month? Z starts crying and says, Dr. Garg, I cannot take a medication which can make me go blind. I'm a single mother, I take care of kids, and I cannot afford to get blind. That very moment made me appall, appalled me and got me thinking that what are the patients thinking about the medications? How are they getting their mis this kind of misinformation? How can we do better to explain how hydroxychloroquine is such a pivotal therapy for lupus patients? And above all, that how many more patients are just in the same boat as patient Z. So let's talk about lupus past, present, and future in regards of medications, morbidity, and mortality. I have no financial disclosures. So for the next one hour, I laid out certain goals for our talk. First, to talk about hydroxychloroquine and medications to address this big non-adherence and how to target and encourage our patients to take hydroxychloroquine. Talk about morbidity and mortality and other causes besides lupus with a special focus on cardiovascular disease in lupus patients and how to predict and prevent cardiovascular disease in lupus patients. So let's start with an, a brief overview of things which we need to know about lupus. Lupus is a lifelong autoimmune disease. It affects 1.5 million people across the nation. 90% of the patients are female from female patient population from reproductive age group. It is two to three times more prevalent in women of color. It can affect any organ system of the body. Approximately 30% of the patients ends up having end-stage renal disease requiring dialysis. 40% of the patients suffer from subclinical atherosclerosis, and 16% of patients do uh, experience an acute cardiovascular disease event during their life course. 
So why should we be concerned about hydra, about lupus? In this study done over uh, looking at trends of mortality in lupus patients compared to gen uh, general population over 46 years, the studies show that uh, in comparison to 1968, uh, the mortality has increased in lupus population by 34%. Further, we should be concerned because we have been treating lupus for more than 100 years, and still we have only three FDA-approved medications. And particularly in Wisconsin, we should be concerned because Wisconsin is the only state with increasing health disparities in regards of uh, women of color. And lupus, as we all know, that is affecting women of color more commonly, so it becomes an important target for us. So just to review, the common causes of lupus, it is a female predominant disease. Researchers have shown that because of endogenous hormones or mutations on X chromosome, uh, females are more predisposed to develop lupus. There is a genetic predisposition to develop lupus. Um, studies have shown that 30% of uh, tw identical twins have a risk of 30% uh, chance of having lupus uh, if, uh, they are, um, if they have a sibling, his or her sibling has lupus. And uh, for the rest family members with a first degree relative or siblings or fraternal twins, the risk is five to 10%. There is a role of environmental triggers like sunlight, UV rays, uh, stress, smoking, and viral infections. And there are certain interactions which we should be aware of, especially sulfur medications, which makes lupus patients more sensitive to sunlight and increased risk of trigger of lupus, and estrogens, which is recommended not to be used in severe form of lupus, or um, renal presentation or antiphospholipid syndrome, because it can increase the risk of flares and blood clots so there is a mixed literature about it. So let's see how um, these causes and factors which we just learned about interplay at cellular level. So these are the triggers which, we, uh, which are sunlight, stress, viral infections, smoking. All these triggers leads to increased cellular damage in lupus patients, which bring, increases nuclear debris. And because of defective clearance in lupus patients, because of that inherit, inherited um, genetic factor, they lead, this leads to increased antibody production in lupus patients. So let's focus on just the highlighted areas of the slide. So we just saw that the antibody was formed, how antibodies was formed in lupus patients. That antibody forms an antigen antibody complex, and this leads to activation of dendritic cells, especially through the toll-like receptors. And once the toll-like receptors are activated, they lead to activation of interferon alpha signature, and this leads to activation of B cells, which increases the uh, proliferation, survival, enhance the whole inflammatory cascade in lupus patients. So let's move on to talk about medications with a focus on hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is the most frequently used medication in lupus patients. It was um, first used for lupus patients in 1955, and soon it got its FDA approval in 1957. Um, per the recent guidelines of, um, uh, from American Association of Ophthalmology, uh, hydroxychloroquine monitoring is uh, a baseline eye exam is required, followed by an annual eye exam after five years of medication use. And coming on to the concern for maculopathy. The concern or risk for toxic uh, retinopathy for the first 10 years of uh, medication use is not very high. As you can uh, see in this graph, especially the center blue line, that is the doses which we recommend in clinical setting, five milligram per kilogram per day. And for the first 10 years or 15 years of use, you can see that the risk of toxic toxicity is not that high. So it's, it's a very safe medication in regards of um, side effects. The other side effects to be kept in mind are uh, more commonly patients report GI side effects, uh, nausea, vomiting, but patients do get tolerant to these side effects after uh, several weeks of use. 
skin pigmentation is more of a cosmetic side effect, and it is not a contraindication to stop hydroxychloroquine therapy. Finally, cardiomyopathy is a rare side effect. It is reported uh, in less than 1% of patients uh, on hydroxychloroquine. So let's look at how hydroxychloroquine works at cellular level. As you can see in this uh, diagram, so this is the antigen-antibody complex, which gets incorporated inside the cell, especially the endosome. This leads to activation of toll-like receptors, which leads to activation of interferon alpha signature in lupus patients. So hydroxychloroquine incorporates inside the cell, and then it leads to decreased endosomal activation, decreased maturation of endosomes, and it also makes the DNA antibody not a good fit for activation of toll-like receptors. All this leads to decreased activation of toll-like receptors, which leads to decreased activation of interferon alpha signature. And this leads to decreased B-cell activation, as just we saw in previous slides. So now that we know hydroxychloroquine does not carry much of side effects for use and how it works in lupus patients, so let's uh, discuss why it is such an important therapy for lupus patients. So hydroxychloroquine decreases the risk of having a disease flare or disease activity by 50%. Studies have shown that the, it is um, in, uh, in patients who are clinically quiescent, they don't have active disease, but serologically active, which means they have low complements and high DNA antibody level, in those patients who continue to be on hydroxychloroquine, in comparison to patients who stop taking hydroxychloroquine, the patients who are on hydroxychloroquine uh, flare less often as compared to patients who stop taking hydroxychloroquine. It also decreases acquired or cumulative organ damage in lupus patients. It uh, imparts a thromboprotective effect. It decreases the risk of having a blood clot in lupus patients by 68%. And this is through its antiplatelet aggregation effect and anti uh, ability to inhibit antiphospholipid antibody. It also imparts an uh, anti-atherosclerotic effect. In this regard, hydroxychloroquine also uh, imparts some cardioprotective effects. So uh, it leads to block stabilization because of, and its antiplatelet properties leads to decreased atherosclerosis and um, its ability to decrease blood pressure and cholesterol makes it, uh, again, um, impart all its cardioprotective effect. And finally, hydroxychloroquine prolongs life in lupus patients by decreasing mortality. A study which was done looking at patients who are um, looking at survival probability um, in lupus patients during their disease course uh, and comparing hydrox patients who were on hydroxychloroquine, that's a black solid line, in comparison to patients who were just on aspirin, that's a black dashed line. And um, looking at the time uh, disease duration, uh, which is on the x-axis, and survival probability on y-axis, you can see that around four to, uh, five to six years of uh, disease duration, there is a significant drop in survival in patients who were not on hydroxychloroquine. And similarly, around 14 years or 15 years of lupus disease duration, there is another significant drop in survival in patients who were not taking hydroxychloroquine. So overall, the studies, similar studies highlight, this study and similar others highlight that hydroxychloroquine prolongs survival in, by decreasing mortality in lupus patients. So despite the fact that hydroxychloroquine has minimal side, of, side effect profile and is so, uh, has such a pivotal uh, role in lupus patients, but still hydroxychloroquine adherence is an issue. A global study which was done looking at hydroxychloroquine adherence highlighted that 50% of patients are not taking hydroxychloroquine as recommended. And about 33%, only 33% of patients were getting their medications refilled. And in this uh, scenario of non-adherence, how are we doing as a clinic? We found uh, over a study done uh, over 26 weeks or six months period for 113 consecutive lupus clinic visits, we found that 33% of patients were not taking hydroxychloroquine as recommended. So let's talk about how to measure and address non-adherence to hydroxychloroquine. 
There are different ways of measuring and addressing uh, non-adherence in lupus patients. The first being patient-reported questionnaires. So there are two validated questionnaires, ECTG and CQR. Both these questionnaires are 14 to 19 item-based questionnaires, and it takes several minutes for the patient to complete the form, followed by the physician to co calculate a cumulative score, interpret the results, and then discuss adherence strategies for, uh, for, to address non-adherence. It is a time-intensive method and very cumbersome to be implemented in a busy clinical practice. Further, it, an MD or a physician is required to complete the form uh, because there are no guidance on how to address non-adherence or which, how to plan strategies for these patients. The other tool which is available is pharmacy refills. Pharmacy refills is a nice way to track how many medications were refilled, what was the delay in getting the refill, and with all this information, we can calculate what is uh, the non-adherence rate or adherence rate in lupus patients. But two uh, drawbacks, major drawbacks of this way of tool of measuring non-adherence is are uh, the first being that uh, patients are not using the same pharmacy all the time, so it's very difficult to track data from multiple pharmacies to get um, during that clinic visit. The other uh, limitation is that uh, the concept is that medications refilled are not equivalent to medications taken. So there can be still some discrepant results despite having a good refill history. So moving on to drug levels, hydroxychloroquine levels uh, have, uh, have promised a, a good correlation between hydroxychloroquine levels and uh, measuring adherence. Um, studies have been done since 2006, and we did move uh, to do a meta-analysis with which Dr. Hansen helped with uh, putting the graph and analysis together. Uh, it showed that there is a strong correlation between patients who reported non-adherence and having a sub-therapeutic drug level. In this uh, meta-analysis, we had five uh, studies which looked at correlation between drug levels and uh, patient-reported non-adherence. And pooling the data together, we found that the odds of have patients reporting non-adherence and having sub-therapeutic drug levels was three times, three-fold higher to the patients who reported non-adherence and had below thera above therapeutic drug levels. But despite having such a good correlation, there are still drawbacks of using hydroxychloroquine drug levels uh, in clinical setting, especially with the cost of the lab procedure. It's not a routine lab testing. The threshold is not clearly defined, and also it is difficult to get the result during the clinic visit. So sometimes the non-adherence can remain unaddressed. So moving on to, is there another strategy to measure uh, non-adherence, uh, know what barriers patients are facing, and address them in the real clinic visit, in the real time or during the clinic visit? Composite SMURF tool was prepared by UW Pharmacy Department in partnership with Pharmacy Soci uh, Wisconsin, Society of Wisconsin. It has three sections, the first section being mass revisual analog. It's a scale from zero to 140%. Patients are asked to report their level of adherence based on missed doses or uh, number of doses taken or missed in the past month. If they score less than 80%, they're asked to fill the second section of the form, which uh, addresses barriers to adherence. The barriers are nicely classified in just six categories, so just six questions for patients to fill up. And based on these six categories, there is a crosswalk of adherence strategies for the healthcare team member to discuss with the patient. Those six categories are system, which, uh, which addresses the barriers related with insurance uh, barriers related with transportation, getting refills on time. Motivation, which addresses concerns of taking medications regularly. Understanding, uh, which addresses barriers related to inability to understand um, uh, medication recommendations of healthcare team. Recall, which addresses forgetfulness. Financial, which addresses uh, barriers related to getting um, uh, insurance coverage, uh, medication cost, 
And finally, an overlap category for other barriers or other concerns uh, or side effect, uh, concerns related to side effect of medication and understanding issues uh, related to medications. We used Smurf tool in our clinical setting and we found that 33% of patients were not taking hydroxychloroquine as recommended. The common barriers which we found were the overlap category of other concerns, motivation issues, and followed by recall barrier. The common strategies which we planned to overcome these barriers were uh, mot conducting motivational inter uh, in interviews, trying to understand why patients are concerned about taking hydroxychloroquine and overcoming that barrier, using plain language, simple language, to make them understand what the treatment recommendation is, what to expect out of medication, um, and then use these, we also use teach back strategies. We used phone reminders and multiple pill boxes to overcome the recall barrier. Further, we tested feasibility of Smurf tool in lupus patients. We found that out of 113 consecutive visits, almost 93% of the patients completed the forms. And the, re uh, the time to co a complete form was approximately three minutes. And the range was from two to five minutes. And it included completing all three sections of the form plus a uh, discussion for adherence strategies. We found that the non-adherence rate was uh, comparable to published literature using the massive visual analog in lupus patients. And we found that uh, we were able to address 85% of these barriers during the clinic visit. Further, 40% uh, of the forms were completed by a non-physician healthcare team member, including the discussion, uh, discussion for adherence strategies. So now that we know about how pivotal hydroxychloroquine is for lupus patients and how we can address and how we can uh, measure and address non-adherence in lupus patients, let's talk about other medications. Before we leave this category of anti-malarial therapy for lupus patients, let's talk about the other anti-malarial medication which is available. Uh, it is quinacrine. Quinacrine was used for cutaneous lupus long before hydroxychloroquine came into use. But once hydroxychloroquine came into use, the uh, popularity of the medication went up and quinacrine use, uh, quinacrine use decreased. Currently, it is an FDA-recommended medication to be used for cutaneous lupus and to be added on top of hydroxychloroquine. Two antimalarial together uh, brings up two questions. A, well, how we can get quinacrine. So it's a compounded medication, so pharmacies can compound the medication, and sometimes patients have to pay the compounding fees despite a good insurance coverage. Also, it does not increase, the, the combination of quinacrine with hydroxychloroquine does not increase the risk of maculopathy, because quinacrine, unlike other anti-malarial medications, does not uh, deposit or increase the risk of toxic retinopathy. So the combination is uh, pretty safe and does not increase the risk of having toxic retinopathy. The only other side effect which have been uh, rarely reported is yellowish discoloration of skin, but it is not commonly seen with the doses which we use in clinic, which ranges from 50 to 100 milligrams. So next, let's look, uh, briefly review the lupus timeline of uh, so as you can see, 1957, the landmark where hydroxychloroquine and steroids got their first FDA approval. And then after almost 60 years, in 2011, Belimumab got, got its FDA approval. So it has been 70 years since first FDA approved medication, and we only have three FDA approved medications so far. So let's talk about Belimumab, the other FDA approved medication. It's a monoclonal antibody against bliss, which is a cytokine uh, which prolongs or increases B cell survival. In lupus patients, bliss leads to activation of B cell receptors, which leads to increased B cell survival, and this leads to the whole inflammatory cascade in lupus patients. So when Benlista or Belimumab is in the system, it leads, it binds to bliss and leads to, makes the bliss, uh, makes bliss incompatible to bind with the B cell receptors and increases B cell apoptosis. So it leads to the decre uh, decrement in the inflammation in lupus patients. 
It is indicated uh, for patients who are clinically and serologically active, uh, dependent on high doses of steroids, or have a high disease activity index, which is CDI more than six. The trials which were designed excluded patients who had uh, severe lupus nephritis and CNS lupus, but there is uh, some ongoing trial on looking at role of belimumab in uh, patients with lupus nephritis. It is available in IV and subcutaneous form. The common side effects which were reported from the trial were allergic reactions to, uh, to belimumab, more common with IV form of medication. Infections were more common uh, in belimumab arm as compared to the placebo group. And also, there were approximately three to four uh, causes of death because of worsened depression and suicidality. So currently, it is recommended if a patient has untreated uh, depression, uh, not to give them belimumab until unless they have a treated or stable depression. The only absolute contraindication of the medication is uh, severe allergic reactions. Pregnant females were excluded as from, uh, from the trial, so we have not, uh, we don't have enough information on that, but there is an open label trial going on to look at uh, birth outcomes in patients who got pregnant during the BLIS trial. And let's look at lupus future in regards of what trials have been done or are ongoing. So these are the failed trials, uh, rituximab, which is uh, rituximab and ipratuzumab, which are CD20 and 22 inhibitors. They did not show any clinical response in lupus patients. And abatacept is, a, a, it, it is a costumular inhibitor, so it decreases the antigen-presenting cell and T-cell communication and decreases T-cell activation. But again, it did not show any clinical efficacy or improvement in lupus uh, patients. So to focus on where these uh, medications work, you can see the CD20, that's rituximab, uh, and CD22 is where ipratuzumab works. Both these receptors leads to increased B-cell depletion, and uh, abatacept is uh, decreasing the co-stimulation from dendritic cell and T-cell, so it binds or inhibits CD8086 attachment to CD28. But both the, uh, all the three of these trials did, did not show any uh, response. So in green area, are, uh, in uh, green text, are the trials which are going on and have promising future. So the first one is Atakicept, which is an April and bliss inhibitor. So the concept is that April binds to B cell or is a more potent uh, cytokine for B cell survival. So Atakicept binds or blocks April and bliss together and it increases the efficacy or uh, decreases the inflammation significantly in lupus patients. In phase 2B trial, it did show significant moderate response, decreased DNA antibody levels, and decreased prednisone use. It is getting pushed into phase 3 trial probably sometime mid-2019. And uh, the other medication which has a promising future is an interferon alpha monoclonal antibody. So interferon alpha monoclonal antibody, as we all saw, that interferon is activated through toll-like receptors, which is a key intermediate step leading to B-cell activation. So blocking interferon alpha does, uh, did show moderate response in lupus patients, and it would be getting pushed into phase three trials soon. And there is a CD40 ligand blocker, a uh, study which, has, which is going on, we are still awaiting results on that. And CD40 uh, ligand blocker is the same concept as uh, uh, abatacept, but it is where B, uh, it decreases the B cell mediated T cell activation. So uh, we are still uh, waiting for results for this. So let's see how it acts at cellular level. So we talked about atakicept, which blocks the tachy receptors and uh, decreases B cell survival. We talked about interferon alpha, which is an intermediate step to B cell survival. And we talked about the CD40 ligand blo uh, bind blocker, which uh, decreases the B cell mediated T cell activation, which is also playing a role in lupus inflammation. So now that we uh, know about medications, about how to address non adherence, uh, how many FDA approved medications we have, let's talk about morbidity mortality in lupus patients. So this is a graph from 1976. Dr. Yarowitz from Canada, he was the first to highlight 
uh, that there is a bimodal distribution of mortali mor mortality in lupus patients. He highlighted that the first peak during the lup lupus disease course is because of infections and lupus itself, and the second peak is because of cardiovascular disease and lupus, but later on uh, during the disease course. So, and this concept was successfully challenged by one of our own rheumatologists, and we would be discussing this in a bit. So before we talk about the successful challenge, cardiovascular disease and lupus, let's talk briefly about one of the common infections we should be all aware of in lupus patients. Pneumococcal infection, uh, lupus patients are at 13 times higher risk of developing a pneumococcal infection because of genetic polymorphism and immunosuppressive therapy. It can cause pneumonia, sepsis, bacteremia, and CDC recommends that all lupus patients should be on uh, pneumococcal vaccination. The comment should receive combination pneumococcal vaccination. So now let's move on to cardiovascular disease. So as we all just saw that 1976 was the first paper or study which highlighted that cardiovascular disease pre, uh, is uh, causing morbidity and mortality in lupus patients. But for almost 20 years, it was thought that cardiovascular disease is disease of elderly females above 55 years of age. Until 1997, when Dr. Susan Manzi from University of Pittsburgh highlighted that two thirds of these events are happening at ages younger than 55 years of age. Uh, young ages to, in females younger than 55 years. And she also highlighted that there is a 52 times higher odds of having cardiovascular disease in age groups 35 to 45 in comparison to general population. After that, for several years, it was uh, all the focus on studies was looking at premature cardiovascular diseases in females younger than 45 years of age. And the concept was that cardiovascular disease happens but after a certain disease duration until 2014 when Dr. Christy Bartels uh, in her study, in the first study to show that there is a fourfold higher risk of having cardiovascular disease two years before lupus diagnosis. This was the first paper to highlight that there is a risk of cardiovascular disease two years before and in the first two years of lupus diagnosis. And uh, the first study to float around the concept of accelerated atherosclerosis or a delayed lupus diagnosis trying to explain why early, early cardiovascular events are seen in this population. Shortly after, Dr. Yarovitz published his study in 2015 and 2017. He did report that 23 out of his 31 cardiovascular disease events were before two years or within two years of lupus diagnosis. And the concept which they floated around with this, uh, that why is this happening, is that Benign autoimmunity in lupus patients predisposes them to develop early atherosclerosis. When benign autoimmunity moves into serological autoimmunity, the early atherosclerosis moves into subclinical atherosclerosis. When serological autoimmunity go, uh, goes into a full-blown lupus or clinically active lupus presentation, at this time, the subclinical atherosclerotic block is ready, is mature and ready to present as an early cardiovascular disease event. We, uh, we uh, under this slide, we did a study in Emory University, Atlanta, and we found, uh, with a black or an African American predominant cohort with approximately 80% of, uh, of our patients from the minority race and ethnicity. And we found that the cardiovascular disease events are nearly equal in the two periods. So as you can see in this graph, so the black dotted line is anchored to lupus diagnosis, so that's time zero. And the purple bars here represents the early period, which is two years, minus, uh, two years before lupus diagnosis and two years after lupus diagnosis. And the green bars represent the late period, which is from two years after lupus diagnosis until their last follow-up, that was 11 years. And we found that the number of cardiovascular events in the early group were nearly equal to number of cardiovascular events in the late group. We also found that there were more cerebrovascular events or uh, strokes in patients who had uh, in the late group as compared to the early group, so nearly two times. Further, we found that um, 
the study, uh, we found that the indicators of uh, risk of uh, uh, the disease-related indicators of risk of cardiovascular disease in the early period was were age, ages more than 50, and also neurological disease. So there was a six-fold higher, six higher risk of having cardiovascular disease in patients with CNS lupus as compared to patients without CNS lupus. And we found that in the late period, renal disease, so patients who had lupus nephritis had six, a six-fold higher risk or odds of having cardiovascular event as compared to patients who did not have renal disease. So now that we know that cardiovascular diseases causes such a huge morbidity and mortality um, even before lupus diagnosis, so let's see how we can predict and prevent cardiovascular disease. So there are two risk factors in uh, two classes or groups of risk factors in lupus patients, traditional risk factors, which are non-modifiable, age, gender, family history, and modifiable. So diabetes uh, is one of the most common ones because studies have shown that approximately 50% of the patients who developed a cardiovascular event were diabetic. So it is recommended to monitor sugars, sugars in lupus patients regularly. Hypertension and hyperlipidemia increases uh, risk of cardiovascular events by two folds. And it is recommended, again, an annual or a close monitoring of these uh, um, of blood pressure and high cholesterol. Smoking has, sorry. Smoking has three, uh, three, sorry. So smoking has three times higher odds of having cardiovascular events. So it is recommended to lupus patients to try to quit. Uh, we should encourage them to try to quit smoking because it not only decreases the risk of having cardiovascular disease, but it also decreases the risk of having a lupus flare-up. And finally, weight reduction. So uh, studies have shown abnormal waist-hip ratio and BMI more than 30 are risk factors for uh, cardiovascular event in lupus patients. So weight reduction strategies should be discussed with lupus patients. Uh, some uh, interesting weight reduction or uh, strategies or exercise strategies which help with lupus patients with their fatigue and joint pain are yoga, water aerobics, tai chi. So that helps, uh, that solves dual purpose. So moving on to lupus as an indicator uh, or a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Studies and researchers have floated around the idea that lupus should be considered as a cardiovascular disease equivalent, just like diabetes is. Um, and the risk factors are what we can do to monitor. Disease markers can be monitored regularly, which includes complements, DNA antibody levels, and inflammatory markers. Um, Antiphospholipid uh, antibodies does increase the risk of having cardiovascular event by four folds. And um, so it is recommended to monitor this initially. Uh, and um, measuring cumulative damage using slick DI, which is a damage index score, annually can help. Further, in regards of medications, uh, Dr. Yarowitz and Dr. Manzi highlight that uh, we should try to limit steroid use because prolonged uses of even low doses of steroids can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, though there is mixed literature about what the actual duration and dose should be for, uh, to increase that risk. Hydroxychloroquine, I cannot lay enough um, emphasis on how pivotal this therapy is. And in regards of cardiovascular diseases, it decreases the risk of having a cardiovascular event by 50 to 60%. So we should all encourage our patients to take hydroxychloroquine and understand why they don't want to take it and try to encourage them to take it uh, until unless they have absolute contraindication. So despite knowing that cardiovascular disease has increased morbidity and mortality in lupus patients in comparison to HMAT general population, still the disease risk scores, imaging modalities, don't, um, don't help us predict a cardiovascular risk of cardiovascular disease in lupus patients um, uh, as it does in general population. So this all highlights the need of early predictors, which can help us predict cardiovascular disease in lupus patients better. So in this slide, we did a study in lupus nephritis patients looking at renal arth uh, arteriosclerosis, and uh, Dr. Panzen helped with uh, the data and the, uh, the study, 
uh, we found that eight, 189 uh, patients who had validated lupus nephritis, we looked at their pathology reports, and we found that, um, that uh, the burden of renal arteriosclerosis in comparison to healthy donors was two to three decades earlier. And uh, we can see in this graph, the green tables looks at prevalence of renal arteriosclerosis in lupus nephritis patient, and the white columns uh, look at the control data, which was from published data on healthy donors. And we can see that age, sorry for that, ages 40 to 49 uh, have a prevalence of 51.7% uh, for any renal uh, arteriosclerosis and 10.8% for moderate to severe renal arteriosclerosis. And um, it is, sorry for that, 60 to 69 um, in control group had the same prevalence of any arteriosclerosis, and ages 70 to 79 had uh, moderate to severe arteriosclerosis. So uh, it clearly highlights that uh, renal, there is a significant burden of renal arteriosclerosis in lupus nephritis patients, which happens two to three decades before what, what we see in healthy donors. Further, we compared our data to younger lupus nephritis patients, and we found that ages above 45, 40, had 11-fold higher odds of having renal arteriosclerosis in comparison to younger lupus nephritis patients. With this data, we are looking uh, to see if renal arteriosclerosis can be a predictor, an early predictor for cardiovascular disease in lupus patients. So just to summarize the whole talk, we talked about um, hydroxychloroquine, that why it is such a pivotal therapy, uh, because it not only it decreases disease, uh, disease flare-ups, but it prolongs life in lupus patients. And we need to encourage our patients, understand the barriers they are facing to adherence and encourage them to take the medication. In regards of morbidity and mortality, we talked about other causes besides the disease itself, uh, with a focus on infections and cardiovascular disease. We, uh, we talked about early, that cardiovascular disease can happen early and late during the disease course. And we talked about how to prevent and screen uh, cardiovascular disease in lupus patients. And finally, there, we are hopeful that renal arteriosclerosis in lupus nephritis patients might be an early predictor of cardiovascular disease. So a big thank you to all mentors, collaborators. Uh, without, uh, without their help, support, it would not have been impossible to put all the research, data, and these slides together. Thank you all. And I would be interviewing questions. So thank you for a fantastic talk. And for those of you who think you couldn't do research, you know, just your first uh, vignette about your patient and then how she turned that noncompliance into a question that is going to now be part of your research focus is just a great uh, example of how uh, easy it is to start with some very simple thing and how intense it is to actually study that. So we're going to open this up to questions. So uh, questions, Dr. Mackey. So the question is, uh, if there, is, there are genes uh, for um, lupus which have been found uh, which can be targeted to have more of a precision medicine in lupus or like target, uh, have a better target for lupus patients. So there are studies which are go ongoing. There are uh, certain mutations they found more on X chromosome to, um, and that kind of explains uh, why there is a gen uh, gender predisposition, but st still is a work, uh, ongoing work. So we might have uh, more uh, uh, studies on that, but at present there are certain uh, uh, factors which we know, but not like completely know, or we're not uh, testing those regularly. Yes? 
question is that uh, patients who have uh, uh, subclinical atherosclerosis, uh, can, is there a way to diagnose or screen them, uh, especially in uh, lupus patients? Um, so there are not enough, um, to, uh, that's a part of uh, the predicting uh, risk of cardiovascular disease in lupus patients is still a, uh, ongoing work. So we don't have enough data on um, uh, how the risk factors or risk scores would work. But there is some uh, information from Dr. Yorowitz's study that the Framingham risk score, cardiovascular risk score, if we double that score, it gives a good idea of uh, whether the patient is at high risk of having a cardiovascular event. Before their diagnosis. So if someone comes in, they have an MI, they're young, mm -hmm. can you diagnose lupus at that time? Mm -hmm. It depends on um, if there is a concern. Uh, so I'm not sure if there are studies which are looking at cardiovascular diagnosis and then looking at if they get diagnosed with lupus, but uh, if they have concerns or symptoms or family history, there can be, a, there is a possibility they might have serological evidence, so, but not clinically active lupus. So there is a possibility that we might have a subclinical or a um, premature form of cardiovascular disease, serological activity, but not a clinical event. So we can diagnose if there is a concern. Dr. Hansen? Uh, the last time I looked, uh, okay, uh, repeat the question. So the cost of hydroxychloroquine drug levels. So uh, I'm not sure about cost here, but uh, the cost outside is uh, more than uh, 100. Uh, I'm not sure about the cost, so why don't I get back to you about the cost? But it's a costly test for sure. Dr. Barzi. So the question is that with use of Smurf tool, were we able to influence our, uh, what, did we notice a rate of change in non-adherence on their subsequent visit? So uh, the initial study which we did was a feasibility study. So we were addressing the barriers by using the tool, but we did not track back how many patients uh, got, uh, uh, improve their adherence. So we, that, that's the validation study which we are uh, proposing to be, uh, and we would be doing in the future. Any other questions? Well, this was, oh, one more. Okay, so the question is, uh, hydroxychloroquine, um, uh, the dose uh, regimen can be BID daily uh, or one and a half tablet or different ways. So what would be the ideal way? So uh, studies that actually looked at drug levels, does a BID dosing make the drug level uh, different for patients who take it daily? So there is not a significant um, difference between drug levels uh, from BID dosing versus daily. We usually recommend to take it daily during the nighttime, so it solves two purposes. One, it could, uh, the patients don't experience a lot of abdominal cramping or GI side effects when this first started, uh, when they take it with dinner uh, or at bedtime. And the second reason is a lot of patients are missing their uh, one of the BID dosing. So it, it, by consolidating medication, we are not decreasing hydroxychloroquine uh, levels per studies, but we are actually improving adherence. So I usually recommend if they have to take two tablets, take it together at nighttime if they can tolerate, but some patients cannot, so I tell them to take BID. Joe? So the question is whether um, there is uh, some pharmacokinetic difference or absorption issues. 
with the dosing of hydroxychloroquine. So two, two findings, uh, two uh, or three highlights here. So first of all, it's an enteric coated medication. So uh, by splitting, so to meet the five milligram per kilogram per day dose, sometimes uh, patients are uh, splitting the medication to 300. I usually, usually recommend if they have a lot of GI side effects or uh, they're, um, they can take it to take two, day, uh, two tablets on alternate days and one tablet on alternate days. So it keeps the enteric coated uh, or the enteric coating intact and might help with the absorption and also decrease the GI side effects. Um, and the other uh, studies have shown that elevated creatine clearance and increased BMI tend to have lower hydroxychloroquine level. So those are certain other ph pharmacokinetics. But besides that, uh, BID daily or breaking tablets have not shown much of um, a difference in hydroxychloroquine drug levels. So any other questions, please come up to the front. An excellent job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.